There's the unrel unrelenting treadmill of Moore's law. This, this diagram here, there's, there's two curves. One is in blue, and the other one is in yellow. And there's that little merge here that kind of looks an odd color because of GNU plot. Um, and uh, the blue line is sort of the, the goodness that someone working alone can, can impart to a system by, say, optimizing something with uh, hand assembly or sort of improving the system architecture a little bit. And the yellow line is what Moore's Law ends up doing, right? So tomorrow you can take your system, write some assembly code, push a patch for it, and it runs a little bit faster, right? But then uh, a year and a half later, someone will just throw away all your hand optimization, recompile for this platform, and it'll run twice as fast. And so to some extent, hardware's biggest problem has been that just sitting around has been more effective than innovating. All these people who have built these massive parallel machines uh, on the left-hand side are now completely trumped by an NVIDIA graphics card today, for example. Um, so this, too, is coming to an end. No exponentials are forever, right? Um, and we have seen this in the uh, clock six, kind of clock speed, clock scaling. It sort of you know, started in, in the 70s, and I would say right around the turn of the, of the millennium. Uh, clock speed just stopped getting faster, right? Kind of around the two, two and a half gigahertz mark or something like that. I mean, you can buy extreme systems and overclock stuff and push it to four gig, but if you looked at the roadmap originally from like the, from the mid 90s, from Intel, we're supposed to be on like 15, 20 gigahertz right now. We're actually on target for Moore's Law. So that's, that went away very quietly, kind of Intel redid all their numbering schemes to be less megahertz and generation centric to more about cores, right? So lots and lots of cores and most of them sit around idle most of the time. Um, and so currently, Moore's Law right now, this is a, a really interesting slide that was released by NVIDIA showing the, the wafer prices over time. So each of these lines here, so the blue line is an 80 nanometer node, the red line is 55 nanometer, the, the, the green line is uh, 40 nanometer. So each of these are different process nodes, and those lines represent the, the falling cost of those wafers over time. And every line represents sort of a, a 30 to 50 percent improvement in density. So, the, so there's, a, there's a point at which, there's a, there's a cost parity point which you would just jump from one node to another. And you can see that these nodes are getting ever more and more spaced apart. And what you find actually is that, in fact, there's almost no intersection point for the 20 nanometer node and the 18 nanometer node and so forth. So if you look at this chart, basically it shows that, yes, we can make you know, ICs in ever more aggressive processes, but at the end of the day, you're not going to pay for them because there's no crossover point in price. So what does this mean? It means that quite soon these statements will become more true than false. Next year, you cannot buy a faster computer. The computer you have your desk today is the fastest computer you're ever going to own. Next year, you can't buy a flash drive that stores more data. The flash drive in your pocket will be just as big as the flash, flash drive tomorrow. And next year, your phone won't be smaller or more powerful. Your, your phone that you have today is about as good as the phone that you're ever going to need to use. I say this is actually really good news, particularly for like people who are in FOSS and hardware engineers like me, who are, who are small individuals. If you look at that graph of Moore's Law that I was showing before, the yellow line is still there. But just, you don't say Moore's Law is necessarily dead, but it's just slowing down a little bit. So the, the, the yellow line is Moore's Law plotted doubling every 18 months. The green line is Moore's Law um, doubling every 24 months. And sort of that, that sort of pink line on the bottom, which now turns buff because of the overlay, is 36 months, right? We take that graph, we go ahead and plot it on a log scale, so we can sort of kind of see the linear part being a little more exaggerated. What you find is, is that if Moore's Law slows down to a doubling of once every three years, instead of once every year and a half. Someone hand optimizing machine code and constantly offering an incremental improvement on a single process node has almost six years opportunity extra for a product cycle than they had before, right? So before you had to be super fast and super on the ball and you had to essentially be employed full time by a big company to make improvements to products that matter. Now you can go ahead every weekend and just keep on hacking at something, and several years later, it's still actually relevant. It's actually something that you can make an impact on as an individual contributor. So here's some of the implications for this. I mean, there's many, many, many implications, but I only got a 20 minutes left to talk about them. Um, 
but one of them is that ARM is rising now. This was something that was originally used to control toasters and DVD players, and you know, it could be in little tiny boxes. Now it's incredibly ubiquitous. Everyone's got an ARM, several ARMs of them probably right now. I mean, you have two, but you have like many ARMs in your phone, uh, and there's an ARM core, and you're, it's basically everything's got an ARM core in it. And it's actually becoming a serious contender to the x86. The Cortex A15 implementations are pushing well over two gigahertz with quad fours, you have 64 bits targeting servers and so forth. So there's this new architecture that's coming out that has been sort of propelled uh, forward and has actually sort of become the equivalent uh, performance equivalent to the x86. <coughs> Another implication of this is that um, repair culture is becoming more common. It used to be the case that if something broke, uh, you wouldn't fix it, you just throw it away and buy the next thing. There's like, it doesn't even make sense to fix your old Nokia phone or whatever as you buy the next generation, I don't know, Blackberry or iPhone or whatever, you know, type of person you were at the time. Um, now that things are kind of slowing down, it actually seems like maybe if I replace the screen on my phone that I broke, it would be perfectly fine. Like the new phone isn't as compelling. I don't want to pay $1,000 for the new phone. I'll just pay $100 to fix the screen on my phone. So broken gadgets are now actually having more recycling get, uh, value. And this also means that reverse engineering the current gadget you have has more value. For a while, if you would spend like, you know, you know, a couple months trying to work out the connector pinouts and, and build an adapter or whatever it is, you're like, okay, well, that was kind of not worth it because six months later, the new greatest thing out is out and they had a new connector for it. Now you can take a couple years to go ahead and, and ping around and figure out what's going on inside these boxes. And a couple years later, people might actually still be using that phone. So these reverse engineering is actually starting to get more value these days, at least in the hardware front. Um, and so you, one place where you sort of see an evidence, really strong evidence of this repair culture rising is in China. China, the emerging markets are a couple years behind on the tech curve. And so in those markets, what you find is that yesterday's phones becomes today's parts. This is sort of a picture, a very common scene that you see the people taking these phones and pulling off parts and recycling and reselling them. Because for those guys, um, they're actually quite happy to have tech that's a couple years old or that's kind of stabilized and so forth. And what this has led to is this sort of rise of an, an information ecosystem based on this sort of older technology. This technology had time to sort of marinate and well, people reverse engineer it and sort of, you know, publish you now books of schematics on the old Nokia phones and they, they share source and the hardware designs and the CAD and they actually have whole books written about how these transceivers written to, to work and all done in Chinese. Um, and the result is that people are now able to take these uh, ideas and incorporate them into sort of wacky ideas. You know, so on the left here is like this mouse that looks like an Apple mouse, but actually has a phone on the inside. And inside the Apple icon is actually a camera and so on and so forth. And the thing actually works as a mouse too. It's kind of kind of fun. And the right hand side is a is a phone that has only like five buttons on it, but it's meant for like kids, right? So you have a kid, you don't want them texting in class, but you want them to call home. They just went ahead and wedged the phone into this, this sort of wacky um, form factor. And so, uh, if actually there's a little plug for a, a, a workshop that uh, Zob said we're giving later on, uh, tomorrow uh, on Saturday, we're actually going to dive into one of these things and sort of show you how I can hack one of them. We actually have reverse engineered uh, the chipset and made all the hardware available for it online for you guys to access. So tomorrow afternoon, I think at one o'clock, we're going to be doing uh, uh, a workshop if you want to learn more about this stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, um, what this is, is it shows there's an opportunity for small innovators. The people who do this in China are called Shanzai. And they sort of demonstrate that you can build phones with very low capital investment and very small teams. They're not big corporations doing these things. There's small people who sort of wake up going, you know, I really want a phone that has a cigarette lighter in it. And they go ahead and they kind of like draw it out and a small team of people, a, a couple months later, pops out a phone that has a cigarette lighter on the inside because, because they want it. Right? It's not like they have to go through this huge corporate process and get lots of money to do it. And so, you know, this sort of stable platforms and open, open ecosystems help do this, but, you know, these kinds of projects don't happen overnight. One of, the, one of the core things is that you find in open source is that open products take time. The Rev1 stuff that comes out, the stuff you push in the GitHub at the beginning is just kind of almost a sketch, right? And so like, for example, Firefox was started in 2002. It didn't really become usable until many, many years later. Linux was 1991. It took, I mean, I remember looking at Linux 0.9 back in the day, and it was just not really 
it was more likely something we did as a geek project to sort of show that we were just playing around with operating systems and kernels, but there was nothing for it at the time. It took years and years. And uh, LibreOffice, you know, started a long time ago, and only in the last few years has it really, in my opinion, become uh, 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 really usable. Um, so, one of the things is that with technology stabilizing, right, and small disruptive teams, and time for organic growth to happen, along with some repaired DIY culture, do we finally have an opportunity for uh, open hardware impact opportunity? And so, uh, sort of going by this equation, going by this theory, uh, me and actually Sean, Sean's in the audience right here, if you wanna stand up and say hi to everybody, that's what Sean looks like, he's a other guy. He's been working with me for the past few years here in Singapore to do different uh, random crazy projects that we come up with over beers. Um, we decided we would actually try to build our own laptop because all the factors have conspired to make it sort of the right time to do this project. Um, and so we built Novena. It's open hardware, um, so you can go ahead and download the you know the schematics, the board layout, the the 3D files for the system. Uh, it's open firmware. That's you can go to Zob's GitHub repo, XOBS, and so you can pull out all the code required to build your own Novena kernel, as well as things like our test programs and other fun frameworks and infrastructures that uh, you may not actually often see associated with hardware products. And the, the hardware itself is designed for people to mod and hack. So it's actually literally open hardware. Like the, the lid opens with a, the flip of a button and you can actually see the hardware on the inside. We build into it um, this sort of array of mounting bosses. I call it the peak array on the right hand side. And so you can go ahead and just uh, like, you know, screw in. I don't know if you want an Arduino board on the inside or Raspberry Pi inside of your laptop. If you want to go ahead and add some little wacky uh, you know, thing on top of it. Uh, there's an area for you to go ahead and hack that. Uh, and also the, the, in the side panel that covers the ports on the right hand side are replaceable so with the idea that as, you know, if you want to upgrade the motherboard, you don't have to throw in the whole case, you just replace this one panel on the side. In fact, if you want to just, I don't know, just use your case with the Raspberry Pi inside, that's also fine. You can go ahead and just throw in the motherboard drill out this blank panel that we ship with it, put the Raspberry Pi in there, and then hook up to the LCD if you can. And then, and then you have you know, a Raspberry Pi in a Vita case. That's totally fine, right? Um, so it's meant to be open and hackable. We're also building a model that we call the Airling model, um, where there's this guy named Kurt Mottweiler in Portland, Oregon, the United States, who, who's actually building these laptops out of wood. He's you know, made this really cool wood composite that has a, a really nice feel to it, and custom machined aluminum, and all these bits and pieces to it, it looks a lot more conventional. You know, why are we doing an heirloom? <clears throat> the idea is that, you know, as hardware slows down, and as repair culture becomes more common, and people want to keep these things, it, you know, it actually makes sense to build a laptop with exquisite materials and a lot of craftsmanship. And the intention is that, you know, the case will be upgraded and used for years to come. It's not, this is not a static thing. It's like later on, you can go ahead and pop another motherboard on the inside, and you still have this wonderful uh, loom to do your work on. You can hand it down to people later on. Um, and one of the one of the cool things is actually building this laptop is actually very much enabled by the fact that we are open. So working with Kirk out there is super easy. We just sort of say, here's a website, here's our code, here's our a link to the hardware models and so forth. We have a very uh, easy to discourse because there's no NDAs, there's no contracts and crazy stuff around trying to get this all built. <clears throat> so looking back is, you know, how is it Novena possible. Again, this is that, that, that <coughs> slide I showed with the different um, costs of wafers over time. Um, and on the bottom, there's like the little, the, the, you know, the, the x-axis is, is the um, sort of time plot out in quarters. So it starts in the first quarter, 2006, 2007, blah, blah, blah. So that little dashed green line represents the development trajectory of Novena overlaid on this graph. So we started, um, uh, sometime around early 2012, right? And uh, the IMX6, which is the CPU that we're using, so ARM CPU was fabbed in 40 nanometer, just about like six months or a year before that. And, um, and it took us a couple of years to do it, but as you see, through the conception, launch, and delivery, the actual cost of that wafer and that node has actually been almost flat. There's been very little change during that node. 
if you look as a retrospective, if we were to actually try and shift that exact same green bar, even just like two or three years earlier, you can see that that same period of time during the peak of Moore's Law, which is just a few years ago, we would have gone through three process node generations. By the time we delivered, we would have been on a process, silicon process that is three nodes too old, no longer really interesting. We would have delivered an 80 nanometer system when 40 nanometers was hot. And so you would have had a system that was about half the speed of what you could buy today if it took you two years to develop it, right? And so you can see actually moving forward, if you look at this graph moving forward, there's actually lots of time for guys who are doing open hardware to go ahead and really learn the system, figure it out, figure out the kinks of their EDA tool, go through a few revisions of the motherboard, go through all the time of building your own supply chain and so on and so forth, because now Moore's Law has actually kind of reached this point where we've kind of not really ground to a halt, but slowed down a bit. So where to go from here? Well, you know, open hardware is all about building communities around platforms, so please take our IP. You can visit our website, kosagi.com. You can see all of our products listed there, and, you, and, and, and you can, you're, you're more than welcome to, uh, to use it, hack with it, and if possible, contribute back to the community. So um, just as a recap, the experiment that we engaged in, and also sort of my thesis, is that as technology has come to stabilize, um, we can find small disruptive teams around the world uh, who can have the time to, to organically grow communities, and you combine this with sort of a rise in repair DIY culture, and this results in an opportunity for open hardware impact. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>